We're in a series called You Asked For It, as Randy brought up. And come on, one more time for the youth, the youth today. Isn't that awesome? Man, I, that last worship song, I was ready to take off. I really sensed the anointing in the room. Uh, what anointing means simply means it's the presence of God. I really sensed it here today powerfully. And it's just a blessing to see the next generation get it. And that's really what it's all about, is to empower people to know God in a very spectacular way. Well, we are uh, in a series about conflict today, solving conflict without becoming a convict. <laughs> I like that title. I, I'm a little proud of myself for that one. <laughs> I like to rhyme, if you haven't noticed. It's no crime that I rhyme all the time with a glass of lime. But anyhow, that's beside the point. But uh, solving conflict without becoming a convict. I mean, I, you, no matter how hard you try, you cannot stop having conflict if you're in a relationship with anybody. In fact, if there is no conflict, you don't have a relationship. The Bible even alludes to it in the book of Proverbs. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so another man and also a woman sharpens each other. So, you know, with this, this friction stuff that happens, if you let it, it can make you better or it can make you better. And so conflict is a part of life. And if you try to avoid conflict, it's not good. In fact, sometimes marriage is a lot of conflict in marriage. In fact, sometimes marriage is like a deck of cards. You begin with two hearts and a diamond, and you end up with a club and spades. <laughs> the Bible says, I was glad when I came to the house of the Lord. So we think it's fun to have fun in church. Is that okay, everybody? Okay, I grew up in a... Well, in an era where you had to suck on lemons and look like you're ready to die. So we, we try not to do that here. Uh, but all, all king aside, most conflict that we have conflict all the time, most conflict you'll see in life is a result of poor communication. It really is true. I mean, it's amazing we can even communicate at all. Poor communication. I've read statistics over a numerous um, neurological studies and so sociological studies have proven that literally 70 to 80% of most conflict is a result of miscommunication. In fact, the Cuban Missile Crisis back in the 19, 1962, I think it was, that was a big misunderstanding. We almost had World War III, and that's the reason why they installed the bat phone. Uh, what basically, uh, the president had a phone directly to Russia, the Soviet Union, so they could talk things out before things escalated. It was that important to know what was going to happen. In fact, a number of years ago, NASA sent a satellite out for, to go to Mars, and it was like a $300 million satellite, and there was a miscommunication of how they were going to measure the distances, and someone used feet instead of metric, and they crashed the satellite. I don't know what ever happened to that person, but I'm glad I'm not that person that did that. Why? A miscommunication. Happens all the time. I would venture to say most of my, most of my, the conversations my wife and I have together and we ever have uh, engaged discussions, usually it's a result of misunderstanding each other. In fact, I would say, I, I'm not kidding you, if my wife is upset with me or is disappointed with me, she usually has good reason if what she's interpreting is correct. And I've learned that now. Okay, she's upset about something here and I know my wife is an amazing woman. She is. And I know if she's upset about something, there must be a reason, but she surely has it wrong because I'm perfect. <laughs> so, <laughs> but what causes, uh, often it's poor communication. My, my friends, I'm telling you, it's, it's amazing how we communicate. Now, for example, maybe you're a, you're a kid and, and, and maybe you, um, someone says to you, oh, nice job. And when they say nice job, they say it in a sarcastic way. Maybe your father or your mother said nice job, and they'd slap you or punish you. Now you're married, and someone says to you, nice job, and you trigger. And you're like, what is going on? Sometimes we have emotional landmines and spiritual landmines that are in us that get triggered by certain things. And it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to communicate. So one of the things, poor communication, often it's in misunderstanding. I like what George Bernard, uh, Bernard Shaw said. This is so true. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion it took in place. It really is amazing. It really is amazing. We people think we're communicating. We're not even communicating well. In the book of James, it tells us about that. Often it's misunderstandings happen all the time. We should verify before we vilify. 
We should verify the facts. And so someone sent me a, uh, a, a social media post yesterday or the day before. Fisher Price has a Ouija board. It was all over the place. And people are going off. I can't believe Fisher Price. I said, come on. There's no way Fisher Price. Pri Maybe Nickelodeon would do that, but not Fisher Price. Maybe Disney would do that, but not Fisher Price. So I look it up, and sure enough, after 15 minutes of research that I know I'll never get back, <laughs> I found out it was, it was, it was wrong. It was, it was made up. So we have to verify before we vilify. We have to verify before we hear it. See, people send me a, a news story. I don't, frankly, I, guys, am I the only one? I don't know where to get my news anymore. You read MSNBC, they say one thing. You read Fox News, they say another. You need uh, all these different, I'm like, which one do I, I read them both and each one are polar opposite. Trying to get the truth is crazy. In our culture today, it's all about misinformation and you have to work extra hard. And this happens in relationships as well. So know this, my beloved, says in the book of James. Brothers, let every person be what? Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. It says in Bucci 6.18 that there's a reason why God gave you two ears and one mouth. There's no such thing, everybody. That's just, okay. Someone's like this. Where is this? Okay. But seriously, there's a reason why God gave us two ears and one mouth. You've heard it all growing up, right? Often we're quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get anger. Often we're quick to speak, right? Slow to hear and quick to get angry. And, and sometimes, you know, I, I'll have to be honest, I'm Italian and I grew up on Long Island and, you know, and, and I like to kind of, you know, get to the point, hurry up. You know, I, I spent some time in Missouri and in Virginia. I'm like, come on, get, get to it, get to it. And, and, well, the other day we went down the road. I'm like, okay, okay, I get it. Come on, come on. If you're from the South, get over it. But anyhow, um, so sometimes like someone's talking to me, I'm coming up the rebuttal quickly and I'm not even listening. And I'll cut them off. I'm like, what am I doing? So I had to learn to slow down and seek to understand more than to, under, to be understood. And that's so important in communication. It's really not about us. My job is to hear what you're saying. Because if I don't listen well, I'm going to get it wrong. And, and I'm I just important to do that. I like what Max Licato said. He said, conflict is inevitable, but combat is optional. So it's good to get the right Thing. So how do we handle communication? Why do we struggle in relationships with each other? Whether you're married, whether you're single, whether you have friends, we have all this problem. Why is that? Well, often it's this. It's unfulfilled expectations, right? You, you order a medium rare and it comes back well done. I'm kind of ticked off, right? I spent a lot of money. Have you noticed that five guys is now 50 guys? <laughs> it's expensive. Oh my gosh. You're right, you go to the restaurant. I expect good service, and I have to be honest, I'm kind of tough about that. But sometimes you have unfilled expectations in relationships. And I will say, sometimes the problem we have in relationships is you're expecting someone to do only what God can do. And let me say something else. You'll be disappointed in church because church cannot be what God is. What do you mean? Well, let me explain. The church is the body of Christ, and Christ is the head. So if I'm going to have a conversation with somebody, I'm not going to talk to their arm. I'm going to talk to their face. And so if I constantly look at the body and don't talk to the face, I'm not going to have a relationship. And so, so often you and I, we're expecting body parts to be Jesus, and they're not. You're not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. I'm imperfect. You're imperfect. In the church, it's full of imperfect, hypocritical people. We are. Then why bother to go to church? Because they're hypocritical out there too. See, what gives us hope and power is we recognize that we need God. And so I've learned not to expect too much from people, but expect much from God. Doesn't mean that I don't care about people. It means I'm not looking for you to be God because you can't be God. My spouse cannot be God. I've learned a long time ago, Sandra cannot be God. She can be a goddess, but she cannot be God. Where is she? I'm, I'm getting all these points and she's not even here. Come on. You have to watch the next service. So we, we, keep, we must keep focus on God himself. And that is so important. We put too much pressure on the person that only God can do. And that's, I'm gonna tell you right now, if you're married and you're thinking that, some, that your spouse is supposed to make you happy, good luck. Seriously. Oh, once, one day I'll get married and then we'll live happily. No, you won't. 
I'm telling you, if you can't be happy without somebody, you will not be happy with somebody. Can I hear an amen to everyone that's married? Okay, truly. Only God can make you truly satisfied. And when you understand that, it changes everything. I mean, I, I can't make, I, it's so important you guys need to understand that no one can fulfill what God can fulfill. So we want to help each other with that. So unfulfilled expectations is another one. And the Bible says this in the book of James. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Okay, your biggest problem is not your spouse. Your biggest, oh, there she is. Hi, honey. She's so love struck, she can barely walk. <laughs> oh, no, all kidding aside, guys, thank you for all the love you've shown Sandra and I after she broke her ankle back in January 14th. It's been a long battle, but I so appreciate um, the fact that she's doing so much better. So thank you, guys. Give yourself a hand for that. Thank you. And, um, and let, me, let me just say that uh, I love Sandra now more than I ever have in my entire life. And I'm so excited that at, at 24 years, I'm more in love, more passionate with my wife, Sandra, than I've ever been. And now I understand why my dad had such a great marriage with my mom at 64 years. It keeps getting better and better and better. And the reason why is because we know that only God can satisfy us. We cannot satisfy each other. Only God can do that. And with that, we have hope to, to be, bring each other closer to Christ. So I can't put too much pressure on Sandra to be something only God can be. But I want her to be what God's created her to be, right? So often we have these passions that are at war within us. And you desire and do not have, so you murder you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Why? You do not have because you do not ask, right? And when you ask, you don't get because of your motives are all wrong. You want only what you will give, give you pleasure. So we often do that. We have the wrong motivations. I want this. Why? So I can be successful. It's very easy for me to say, I want to have a successful church, so I feel I'm important. If that's the reason why I want to be a pastor, good luck, Right? And that can happen in your job. You want to do well so you can go back to the high school reunion and show how good you have. I had a friend that I knew about a number of years ago. He moved to another country, and he had friends coming. He's like, uh-oh, I'm going to rent a bigger house. I'm going, to, I'm going to rent a Mercedes so they think I'm doing better than I'm doing because it's all about what people think about me. What a horrible place to live. Why not just be good with God and be good a good place with God instead? So that's important. So what else do we have to do in order to have relationships is often it's poor communication, unfulfilled, unfulfilled expectations, and despising differences. Guys, we cannot fight over preferences. I'm telling you, it's so important that we, we will focus and we're not gonna back down from the essentials of what Christian faith believes. We believe that Jesus is the son of God. He rose again from the dead. We believe that the Bible is the word of God. We believe in, in the sanctity of life. We believe in man and woman are made in God's image. We believe all these things. We're not going to turn back down, but I'm not going to argue over somebody whether a hymn book is better than a video screen. I'm not going to argue with someone if it's better, it's better to have baptism or sprinkle. It's just not worth doing that. I want to focus on the absolutes, right? And so we have to let our preferences go. I mean, some of you like Rocky Road. And some of you like vanilla ice cream. Some of you are, are peanut, uh, you have nut allergies. So you cannot have Rocky Road. So what's the big deal about that? Why are you going to argue over that? And you say, well, people don't, people don't argue over that. Yes, they do. Hey, you haven't been in my house. <laughs> but all kidding aside, we often argue over things that frankly don't matter. And, and let's be honest, our government's about that right now. The whole objective of the political parties is to get the other guy to look like a complete demon so you'll give money and give your attention and vote. That's the whole purpose, is to show the differences. But the most important thing you, we can, you and I can do, the or, in order to bring someone to new ground, you have to find common ground, right? The apostle Paul says, I'm all things to all people that they may know Christ. And so we should be helping to build bridges, not burn them, right? And so I wanna encourage us, you can always find, everyone pretty much has the same desire, they want to be healthy. They want to have good relationships. They want to do well in their life. So when I focus on that, then you establish a relationship. Then you have influence. Throwing stones at someone really helps. That makes sense? And we could be a lot different if we would do that. Just listen, ask questions, and watch what God will do in our interpersonal relationships as well. So we have that going on. Then we also have this issue, sin nature, right? We, we, we all have sins. The Bible says the following, 
For everyone has sinned. You know what sin means? Miss the mark. And we all fall short of God's glorious standard. So all of us are a wreck. Look at your neighbor, say you're a piece of work. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a beautiful piece of work. If you're single, get their number. <laughs> There's a reason people come to church, by the way. I found my wife in church. All right, now, okay, very, we'll move on, okay. <laughs> my tenders in church, okay. Hang on. Four ways, that didn't come out right. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Four ways to deal with conflict. Think before you speak. Uh, here's one way, my way. I did it my way. I want it my way. It has to be my way. I want to watch what I want to watch. I want to do what I want to do. And that's not the way to do it. You have you're my way. You have your way. Here's your way is I'm going to be passive. Okay, fine, honey, go ahead. Okay, sure, honey. No problem, honey. Sure. Okay, fine, fine. If you do that in a relationship or a marriage, which you keep on doing, you put your disappointments in the closet, right? And it gets full. And you start pushing that door shut. You really get it shut. You keep pushing. Eventually, that door is going to blow off its hinges. So being passive is not a good idea. I've known people that have been quiet in their marriage for 15 years. Finally, they blow up and they're done. And you had no idea what happened. That's not good. So my way, your way. Here's another one. Halfway. That works well. Halfway there, right? Living on a prayer. So you do it halfway. Halfway. What happens with halfway? 50%, 50%. And what is 50%? Failure. It's 100%. So it's not my way, your way. It's not halfway. You know which way it is? You guys read my notes. It's called God's way. You guys are smarter than any other service. Give yourself a hand. God's way really is the only way. And we have to understand that God knows a lot better than we do. It's amazing that the Bible has said things for 4,000 years. And now we come up with things that science says, oh, it's good to forgive each other. It's good for your health. And the Bible said it a long time ago, right? The Bible says a man thinks in his heart he shall become. Man, and the Bible says you should be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, we, oh, we, we call it cognitive therapy. Right? So the Bible says things for thousands of years, and finally we get it. All, all God's truth is truth. And so it's God's way. God's really the only way. And so sometimes someone will come to me and say, I'm, I'm struggling my relationship. We're, we're fighting all the time. We're like cats and dogs. I'm like, oh, great. Well, not, that's not great, but yeah, okay. So tell you what, why don't you stop talking about each other for a few moments, and why don't you get closer to God and get closer to God? What does that mean? Why don't you every day take about 15 minutes to read your Bible, to pray, and spend time with God? Make it, make it a, I want you to come to church, get involved with a small group, and get involved. Draw closer to God. And if you do that, it will change everything else. Because your problem is not somebody else, it's you. And when you draw closer to God, it changes everything. God's way is the only way. The only way. And in fact, sometimes what can happen is, I want to tell you a story. You might have heard of it. A guy named Jacob in the Bible. Jacob uh, had a brother named Esau. And he's found in Genesis 28 and, verse, and also uh, Genesis 28 to 30. And what happens in this, I'm sorry, Genesis 31. Uh, what happens is he eventually goes to his uncle Laban's house. He wants to find a good, good looking woman. And he found a good looking woman. Rachel's beautiful. And he's like, hey, Uncle Laban, I want to marry your daughter. He goes, great, you got to work for me for seven years. And the Bible says that the seven years went real quick. There's a reason why life is going so fast for me, because I, I, I love my wife so much, it goes quick, right? <laughs> okay. So, so what happens is, what, it goes really quick, right? And now it's, now it's marriage night. Great, I've been waiting for seven years. So the next morning, as he consummates his marriage, he wakes up. It's not his wife. It's her ugly steps, ugly sister. She got hit with the ugly stick. Leah. It's Leah. Now, how did this happen? How did he end up with the wrong woman? Pastor Randy next week is going to speak on that. So, but what can happen is, so what happens is, he, he has his trouble. This goes on and on. He's got trouble with his brother. He's got trouble. Uncle Laban has changed his wages many times, has swindled him, and he's kind of getting what he sowed. Finally, he gets to a place where he begins to build an altar to the Lord, and his life changes. For example, you can see in the book of Ecclesiastes, 
There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. Sometimes we gather stones to throw them, but sometimes it's a time to gather stones to make an altar to the Lord. And when Jacob was at his darkest hour and there's a lot of pressure in his life, what am I going to do? What does he do? So he said to his relative, gather some stones. So they took the stones and piled them in a heap and they ate there by the heap. He made an altar to the Lord. The only way you can alter your life is by going to the altar of God. You have to be willing to lay down your life as a sacrifice. And what happened to Jacob is he went before the Lord. Finally, he died to his scheming ways. And God changed his name to Israel. Why? Because he had an altar. My friends, the only way you and I can really have any kind of good relationship, you and I need to build an altar to God. And we have to lay down our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, before you can ever work on another person, first let God do a work inside of you. I'm sure you've heard the brilliant cliche, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> it's, it's really true. It is you. And so really, it's all about how I respond to something, right? So if I want to change the world, I don't change the world by changing the world. I change the world by changing me so I can see clearly to change the world. Jesus talks about it all the time. He says, why do you try to take the speck out of your brother's eye when you have a log in yours, which is kind of a funny way of talking in the original Greek. And so basically what that simply means is before you can help anyone else out, first do an inventory of yourself, then you can help somebody else out. So before you're out there, correct everyone, make sure you're dealing with your own stuff first. And it keeps you humble. Doesn't mean you don't do something. So, and this is something true as well. Conflict cannot continue without my participation. Conflict cannot continue without my participation. If I throw a ball to you and you don't throw it back, we're not having catch. But if I throw a ball to you and you throw it back to me and I throw it to you, right? So why, don't answer an insult with an insult. So don't participate with it. It's very hard to have an argument if you're not participating. Don't participate in it. And sometimes the ice treatment is, if that's a passive aggressive way. I mean, I don't mean not yelling. I mean, don't participate in including manipulations by ice. Okay, that's not a, I've, I've known people that have not spoken to their spouse for a week at a time. That's cruel. That's not good either. That's still manipulation. Do you see that? So it doesn't mean you don't open your mouth. Sometimes you can do it in a bad way. So conflict cannot continue without my participation. See, I have been what? Crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So conflict cannot continue without my participation, and I will act and not react. We talked about this in the past. You know what they call people? when they? What do they call fire, fire people, police people? What do they call them? How come they don't call them first reactors? Right? You don't want a reactor coming to you, right? A reactor is good for, for nuclear energy, okay? You want a responder. What does a responder do? What do they do? They practice. Firemen or fire people, I'm sorry, I don't know what to call them anymore, fire people. Um, anyhow, um, one man and man both have man in it, okay? Is it okay? Okay. So anyhow, they're climbing towers, they're doing all types of things, they're practicing, so when something happens, they know what to do, right? So you wanna, you, wanna, you wanna practice, so when it happens, you can respond. So sometimes the best thing to do is to practice what's gonna happen. Like for example, if I come home and I open the garage and I, I'm expecting, right now, Sandra, she's, you know, struggling, she's trying to do everything around the house and the kids are laying on the couches and they have their phones open and the TV going, and music playing, and there's chaos in the house, and they're like this. What do you do? The three of them are sitting there doing nothing. I'm making this up. This would never happen. What would I do? The first thing you do is you turn off the Wi-Fi, but that's not good enough because they have cellular data. So you turn off the cellular data first, then the Wi-Fi, and watch what happens. All of a sudden, you're, Mom, Dad, Dad. 
And then they start shaking like this. Turn it on, right? So sometimes the best thing we can do, I want to act, not react. And so how about we start thinking, listen, I, I wish I could tell you, how many of you are in relationships and you keep falling over the same thing all the time? You keep arguing over the same thing. Can I, can I tell you a little secret about me? Is that all right? I'm terrible at directions. I mean, I can have my watch vibrating to tell me, come make a right. Siri is talking to me. I have a screen on front of me. I have a screen on the dashboard and a screen on my phone. And I still miss, a, miss, I still miss it. And then I, you know what I do? Guess who I blame? Sandra. I bless, I, I blame Sandra. Now that's happening. How many years now, honey? 24 years? So, you know, seriously, so, sometimes it's like, okay, let's, let's figure this out. Let, let's figure out how do we stop this from happening? We keep doing the same thing over and over again. Let's, okay, um, I notice that when it's late at night, I'm a little more agitated. So uh, I get more agitated. So why don't we plan not to talk about situations at night? You know, you try to find things like that. So I will act and not react. Be angry and do what? Do not sin. Anger is not a sin, but sin is doing the wrong thing when you're angry. Be angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and what? Give an opportunity to the devil. That's right. You can allow and you can open the door of your life and let the rats of the demonic realm into your life by being bitter, by being angry, but not forgiving. And so I'm, I'm telling you how important it is to not give an opportunity to the enemy. So it says, do, do not let the sun go down on your anger. I've shared this before, but I will say that my saving, our saving grace in our marriage is that Sandra and I do not let conflict go over 24 hours. I cannot remember, maybe you can, but I honestly cannot remember a conflict we've had that we had not at least a peace treaty beforehand. Now, when we first got married, I was a literalist. The sun settled. We, we can't, we got to deal with this right now, right? It's two o'clock in the morning. I'm trying to settle it. I can't think at two o'clock in the morning. And you start arguing and it doesn't work. So what we've learned, we have the Barney syndrome. What that is, we, we, we actually say, I love you, you love me, we're a happy family, we'll talk about it tomorrow. So what I encourage you to do is get a little purple dinosaur and put it at your bedside. And every time there's a problem, you push the button and let them sing to you. So the best thing to do, sometimes the best thing to do is just go to sleep. And then the next morning you wake up, well, what was I arguing about? I don't even remember what it was. But honey, I will say, and I, I, I say this because I have learned that when Sandra is upset about something, there's usually a good reason. When I'm upset about something, you're usually not a good reason. So we don't want to give opportunity. So what happens is if, you have, if you're in a relationship with somebody, whether you're married, whether you're single, you have friends, and if you don't deal with conflict, it, what happens is it begins to collect, it gets hardened, and it goes on and on and on, and these little problems become a problem. Often what happens in arguments is this. Now, no one's ever done this before. You ever argue about something, and an hour into your argument, you don't even know what you're arguing about? You're arguing how you argue. Don't you raise your voice at me, right? So isn't it best to say, you know what? I love you. You're not my enemy. So guys, I'm telling you right now, one of the biggest secrets we have that's helped our marriage, it's helped my parents' marriage, is do not let 24 hours go on without settling your disputes, whether you're married or single, in your friendships. It will help you tremendously. Because it's hard when it compounds. It's like interest. It multiplies. And so sometimes what you have to do is get it off the dish. If you leave the dishes overnight without putting water in them, they're going to be hardened the following day. You ever leave cornflakes on your, on your cereal bowl overnight? You have to pretty much destroy the bowl to get it off, right? It's best to deal with it the same day. Never put it off. Never Call names, you stupid idiot. What's wrong with you, idiot? Now, I've never done that. Uh, you're acting like an idiot. I didn't say you're an idiot. I said you're acting like an idiot. And so maybe you tell a child or tell someone, you, you're so ugly. I'm, I wish I never married you. Oh, God. That's hurt. That hurts. Oh, I didn't mean it. It's like taking two, I'm squirting toothpaste out and trying to put it back in. Sometimes with our words, I, I listen, I'm quick with my tongue. And I've said some stupid things through the, even in, not only just in preaching, but I've said some bad things, which I wish I could take back and I can't. 
I said, I didn't really mean that. We'd be very careful. Never call names. They've, they've proven without shadow of a doubt that couples that call each other's names usually have divorces. A high percentage of them of go through divorce. How about seldom raise your voice? Now, I, I, I'm, sometimes you have to raise your voice. If I didn't raise my voice, I wouldn't be Italian, okay? So, for example, I remember when I was not married to Sandra, I'd take someone on a date, and we'd start talking. I'm like, how you doing? Where do you want to go? I don't know, whatever you want to go. Okay. What do you want to go to eat? I don't care. Okay. Everything was like, hi. It was a boring. It's like beautiful boring. No, thank you. <laughs> like a woman has a little kickback, right? Uh, but it's good to have a relationship with somebody that's going to challenge you. And by the way, if you're dating right now, you need that challenge in your life. Someone's going to make you a better person. So seldom raise your voice. You know what the Bible also says? It says, open rebuke is better than hidden love. Open rebuke is better than hidden love. Parents, sometimes your kids will, will react and act very poorly because they're not sh being shown love. So they act in a way you have to correct them so they get attention. It's very important that we express ourselves, that we share our loves with each other. So that's what begins to happen. So seldom raise your voice. Here's another one. Never get historical. Now, um, elephants and women, <laughs> I'm sorry if you think I'm a sexist, I am, no, I'm just kidding, but um, seriously, there's differences between men and women, women have great memories, right? I can't even remember what I ate last night, but I, I know, for example, Sandra never did this, but if she did, remember 1999, we went to Olive Garden? You were on your sixth breadstick. And you told me, pa, 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 pa. I'm like, what? I have no idea what I said, right? We actually, we had to learn, by the way, we had to learn that because we first got married. That's kind of what happened. And, and historical, uh, I get hysterical when she gets historical because I, I can't, I don't have that kind of memory, right? I, I cannot win against chat GPT or my wife. So never get historical because God doesn't get historical with you. He separates as far as the east is from the west, so he's forgiven us. So we should not keep on bringing that back on someone. It's easy to do. Never say always and never. I just said it. I know. You always are late. No, you often are late. And give an example. You never listen to what I say. No, don't say that. That's looking for a fight. You make me angry. No one makes me angry. This is what I say. When you do this, I get angry. That's accurate. Now I'm putting the responsibility on me, and it kind of lowers the threshold of the argument, right? Take personal responsibility and never threaten, if you're married, never threaten divorce. Can you imagine going to a plane and the pilot suicidal? <laughs> it's like, I'm climbing to 35,000 feet. I think I'm going to crash the plane. <laughs> Would you go on an airplane? But how on earth are you going to fly your marriage if you're always talking the D word? Seriously. Be a man. Keep your commitments. Be a woman. Keep your commitments. You know what makes life value? Valuable commitments. Being faithful. I'm telling you. I can honestly tell you I will never divorce my wife. I might kill her, but I won't divorce her. And, you know, and sometimes you know, I'm going to talk to a lawyer about my taxes. So make sure, make sure you have that in your back pocket and you start making mistakes to say about my taxes, okay? But any, anyhow, never threaten divorce. And, and, and just tell you, these are things that will help us. So conflict cannot continue without my participation. I will act, not react. I will focus on the good things in you. Focus on the good things, not the bad things. And it's this I struggle with. And I've even struggled here sometimes at the staff at Cornerstone because sometimes I, I notice everything that's wrong. You know, I'll, I'll notice that there's a chip on the wall, right? You'll, the guy will paint the whole wall and I notice one chip. And I have to mention that, of course, because we want things to be good. And so you can do that in a relationship. So why not focus what's good? Tell people what's going well, not just the bad things. 
Because you drive towards what's bad. And you train someone to think what's bad all the time. Drive to what's good. So that's important too. I will focus on the good things of you. I will talk about what's good. And what you do, when you focus on the good, what you're doing is you're throwing gasoline on the fire of that good where it burns brighter and hotter. And you're encouraging the person instead of discouraging the person. Do you still deal with issues? Yes. But I'm telling, they used to say it takes seven positive from one negative. I've read now it's like 14 because our culture is so negative. And I will apply God's grace to you. I will apply God's grace to you. What does that mean? <laughs> the Apostle Paul said it when he first began to write his letters. The Apostle Paul, an apostle of God and Lord Jesus Christ, called by God, really, you know, confident. But his last letter he wrote, I'm a chief of sinners. You know, what happens is the closer you get to God, the more you realize you're not God and you need him bad. The more the lights go up, everyone looks good when it's dark. <laughs> Put the lights up. You start seeing all the flaws of your life, right? And this is what begins to happen. I will apply God's grace to me. You see, beloved, do not avenge for yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, it's my favorite part, ye will heap coals of fire on his head. No. Nope. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, why would it say something like, put a, kill him with kindness? No, that's not what it means. Actually, it means something, that actually it fits into the context of this verse. Back in the days of Jesus and the Old Testament, it was hard to get fire. So what they would do, often people would carry things on their head. You go to certain countries in the world. I've been to India, I've been to Ghana and other places, and what they do, they'll take, they'll take things and they'll carry them on their head like a backpack. So what they used to do in those days, they have a special basket, and they would take these hot coals, and they'd deliver it to someone's house to start a fire rather than sit there and try to make a fire happen. So it was a nice thing to do. So the Bible is saying, for in doing so, what's going to happen here? I replace it. No, no. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In so doing so, you'll be a blessing to him. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Why is that? Do not avenge yourself, but, latter, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Listen, I know I've shared this story before, but it's such a good story. I'm going to have to share it again that we've learned this throughout my life. My dad grew up, I was a pastor's kid and grew up and, and long story short, we had a, my dad was part of a church and the church had unbiblical things happening and uh, was one of the elders of the church. They had the eldership, uh, rulership back in those days. And uh, the, basically there were people experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit and some of the kids began to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And one of the elders said, you cannot do this. And I want this in our church. You need to fire the youth pastor because he's leading people into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. My dad said, I cannot do that. Why? It's in the Bible. Well, I don't want my kids having baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'd rather have my child on drugs. Well, guess what happened to that, that elder's daughter? Was on drugs, was committed. Bad. Then we leave the church, we are involved in another church, and all of a sudden, every once in a while, we kept getting flat tires. It's like, my mother keeps from running over nails. I'm like, Honey, Mom, what are you doing? Go to construction sites? What's going on? Why do I keep getting flat tires? And my dad gets it next. And it was intermittent. It was never like, and so we went to the back, of, in front of our driveway, there's nails. So we sweep it up, a month or two goes by, and then we get another flat tire. And, like, and we go to the front, there's more nails. Or someone's throwing nails. I'm getting phone calls in the middle of the night. People giving us magazine orders we never ordered. And things like that. And so one day we're having dinner, and my mother was sitting there. She goes, that does it. Tonight's the night. I'm like, what? She goes, I was praying, and I believe God is telling me that tonight they're going to show up. So like, so my mom doesn't always say that. I'm like, oh, my mom must have heard from God. So what we did, we put on black. Dun, dun, da, da, dun, dun, da, 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 da. I'm sitting there like Tom Cruise running. Anyhow, but I'm behind a bush. I'm, I'm literally behind a bush watching. And sure enough, about 9.30 at night, here comes a Volkswagen bub, and he comes by, opens the window, and throws the nails. My brother chases him, gets his license plate, and my dad drops the charges. I'm like, what? This is our chance to humiliate this guy. Drops the charges. It never happened again. Now, I'm not saying this in a prideful, I'm saying this in a very humble way. 
that man died horrible death of brain cancer. I, I'm, I don't know why, but we have a, their elder's daughter in a, in, a, in a loony bin because of drugs, got the, the, the dying of horrible cancer, and my dad said, I didn't touch it. And, and I can tell you more stories that I will another time about other people that have done things. And that used to make me really angry with my father. Dad, fight back, fight back. And he said, God got this thing. Sometimes you got to release them to the Lord and pray for them. Don't hope something bad happens. Then you, that, that, no, don't do that. Just pray and release it to, and watch what God will do. I've seen it happen, my friends. I've seen God, and I'm very careful now. I don't, I'm very careful with other people that oversee me as well. For in doing so, you will do the heap of coals. So, I will remember God's grace to me. But anyone who does not love does not know God. For God is love. I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way up, please. God showed how much he loved us by sending his own, his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. You know what real love is, everybody? I love you, baby. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> if someone loves you to get something, they don't love you. They love what you're going to give them, not who you are. Save yourself. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to what? Love each other. When you know how much you're loved by God, how can I help love somebody else? When I recognize how, what a wreck I am without God and what a sinner I am without God and how much I need God, how can I not love you? How can I not love somebody that thinks differently than I do? I have to, because God's loved me. Doesn't mean you're wimpy. It means you're strong. Then, when you're in that position of loving somebody, then you can stand in God's authority and watch what God will do in your, in your behalf. Let's pray. Father, in the matchless name of Jesus, I just thank you so much. Lord, I thank you for relationships that are most wonderful and the most challenging things that we have. And Father, I am praying right now for relationships between friends, relationships between brothers and sisters, children and their parents, and husbands and wives, and people within the church. Lord, we thank you that iron sharpens iron. Father, we're praying that through the conflicts we have, that we would grow closer to you and see you more clearly. Lord, I ask a blessing upon all of us today. All of us can grow in one or many of these areas that we talked about today. But most of all, Lord God, loving you and being loved by you so we can love each other well in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for healing of marriages, healing of relationships. Father, forgive us for trying to grab and get all the time instead of give. Lord, we surrender to you in Jesus' name.